Uh, welcome to the University of Chicago. On behalf of several people, likely over the course of the next several hours and even the next couple of days, um, I want to, you know, make a especially warm welcome to our parents, you know, of international students. You all have come, you know, uh, from from afar, and we're happy that you're here. We're happy your children are here, um, and we look forward to working with them and also with you over the course of the next four years. I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nick Siemens. I am the director of the Office of International Affairs here at the University of Chicago. Uh, an office, as you see from the slide behind me, uh, that is uh, specifically for international students, for international scholars. So we work also with faculty you know, who are coming from abroad, uh, their families, and of course, uh, students at all levels. Um, we, Look forward to, to working with your students <clears throat> over the course of the next few years. Uh, and they become part of a very global population here at the university, as you can see. Um, currently, you know, overall students, uh, both undergraduates and graduates, the, the international population is, is almost 24%, you know, which is actually quite high. Um, and from, for students from, from over 110 countries, so it's not uh, it, it, there, there is distribution you know, in that. Our office, uh, we'll mention this over the course of the next you know, hour or so, but our office really is a resource for your students. Um, it can be a resource for you as parents. And we love this session because we get to give you the information that we're giving your children. Uh, and then we get to work together almost you know, as co-parents to make sure that they're doing what they need to do you know, over the course of the next few years. So. <clears throat> Again, you can see, you know, just the distribution of international students across the board. Uh, PhD students do make up our largest international population, or excuse me, master's, uh, master's students uh, make up our largest international population, followed by PhD undergraduates and then non-degree visiting students. Um, among the various divisions, the college is the se second most uh, represented internationally. Uh, so among undergraduates, uh, and not probably uh, different than, than other colleges and universities across the, the United States, uh, the top sending countries to the University of Chicago are China, India, and South Korea. I, I like to cover with parents the advising structure. You're going to hear a lot about you know, your student having access to an academic advisor, um, and in this case, having access to an international student advisor, someone that they can go to if they have questions about you know, their immigration documents, their visa, their passport, travel, uh, getting an internship, you know, working with career advancement here at the university, and then getting the related uh, permissions or authorizations you know, in order to actually take that internship. All students are assigned an international student advisor. We have, happen to have Sarah Tolman here uh, up in the front who is the international student advisor to all international students in the college. So Sarah sends a warm welcome every quarter um, and, a, and reaches out via email every quarter to international students in the college. Um, and as you can see, her contact information is here as well. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to either she or I um, over, the, over the course of the next few years. We do encourage students to uh, to come to the office, uh, we meet with them in other locations, um, you know, across the campus. Whether that's in residential halls in advance of breaks, like winter or spring or summer breaks, just to provide them any information they may need, travel signatures, um, you know, ensure that they're not forgetting their documents. You know, you can you can imagine at this point, you know, how many students have made it to O'Hare International Airport and realized that their passport is still in their room, you know? So we try to do our best to remind them, you know, to carry those things, to find a way, a method, you know, that works for them so that they're able to, to ensure that they have all of the documents that they need for travel abroad and reentry. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So Sarah, again, um, even her phone number this time. So <laughs> I know that this session is actually being recorded and will be accessible to you afterwards. So, so don't, don't. Don't worry too much. Sarah's been with the office for a few years now um, and has work, been working solely with uh, 
uh, with undergraduates um, here at the University of Chicago and is familiar with kind of their their rhythm over the course of four years, when they're taking internships, um, when to reach out to them for various things, again, like travel, but also uh, getting close to graduation, thinking about post-graduation employment authorization, uh, and that kind of thing. Some of this information uh, is the same information that we will actually be sharing with your students um, if we didn't already Last week, uh, we will be meeting with your students on Thursday this week as part of their schedule. So they'll be getting this session in a little more in-depth you know, uh, a way with other international students who are current students so that they can share some of their best practices and tips with, with the new students. <clears throat> so I, I've, I've mentioned this before, and we will tell students you know, over and over, but if you have questions, come to the office um, rather than speaking to your friend who goes to Stanford or Columbia or uh, residing you know, or, or trying to um, look for information specifically related to immigration on the internet. Uh, it's a very interesting time in, in this country, uh, as you all probably are aware, and it means that immigration is changing um, quite a bit, you know, even in the past few years. And so we encourage students to come to us so that they're getting the the correct information, the correct legal interpretation, you know, of, uh, of immigration regulation in this country at this moment because it is so complicated. Um, one of the things that we tell students from the, the, uh, from the get-go and that they'll be hearing a number of times over the course of the next couple of weeks is to make sure that they have taken photos with their phones or scanned copies of all of their important immigration documentation and maybe other documents, right? A lot of those things are easier to replace after, uh, after they're lost or destroyed or, you know, God forbid, stolen. Um, those things are easier to replace if you have a copy that you can produce, either from email or on your phone via, uh, via photo, something like that. And also, it just makes it easier if you need to pull up, you know, pull up a number, a reference number, um, you know, anything along those lines. Any questions to this point? So feel free as I go. This is meant really for you to get your, your answers, you know, get answers to your questions and also, um, you know, for, for things to come up that may not be readily apparent on the slides. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is a scan copy adequate for travel or do you need the original? And the answer is you need the original, right? So, so each time, and we'll cover this in, in just a moment, but uh, each time you do leave the United States, and even just to get on an airplane, um, both to depart but also to return, your students are going to need their original documents. So travel, we'll talk specifically about that. We do encourage students to travel. We know that your students are likely to be traveling um, even you know, coming up in December over the winter break and then potentially over the spring break or the summer, summer break for sure, potentially in the first summer. Um, and these are the necessary documents uh, that, that your students need not only to depart the United States but to return. So a valid passport. I often ask this question of students as we meet with them over the course uh, of the, the beginning of each academic year. How many of you know the expiration date of your passport? Anybody have that you know, readily available? I don't often remember it until I'm actually using my passport for something. And then it's like, oh, I need to remember to, to renew it. Um, but your, the, the passport must be valid six months into the future, right? from the next dated entry. An unexpired F1 or J1 visa stamp, that's the sticker that was affixed in the passport by the US consular embassy. Uh, and then, of course, the immigration document, either the I-20 or the DS-2019. Travel signatures uh, are provided to students you know, throughout the year. They're valid for a 12-month period, regardless of the number of times a student may you know, depart and re-enter the United States. Uh, and Again, Sarah, you know, is is the advisor in the office who not only issued the documents to students, but you know, will know kind of when to remind students to say, now's the time you need to get a travel signature. I'm going to be, you know, at 
Campus North on this day and Campus South on this day or at the library on another day. And we like to time those things to correspond uh, to peak travel seasons, typically right before the winter break um, and then again, you know, right before the summer break. So what is a travel signature? It is uh, perhaps the most archaic and bureaucratic, uh, you know, component of the U.S. government, you know, immigration policy. It, it is an actual signature from uh, a school official, you know, on the student's I-20 or DS-2019. In fact, on the I-20, it shows up on the second page and on the DS-2019, uh, the related immigration document to the J-1 visa, it shows up on the first page. So it just means that a student needs a signature every 12 months to facilitate their entry into the United States. So Customs and Border Patrol at the time of passport clearance will look for that travel signature uh, to ensure that a student has actually, I suppose the nature of this is that, you know, they're looking to see that the student has actually seen a school official and by giving a signature, we're ensuring that the, you know, the student is enrolled full time, is in good academic standing, you know, et cetera. Regardless of the number of times you may travel abroad and re-enter over the course of that 12 months, the signature is valid for 12 months. And, and again, your students will be getting reminders about this, you know, leading up to big travel period where we know they're going to be traveling. I think students actually understand the travel signature, you know, bit. Uh, the, the one thing they, they more often, you know, um, they, they, they more often actually forget this document altogether, you know, when, when leaving. Um, so if, if you know that your student has, you know, a document holder of some kind or, you know, uh, keeps important immigration documents, you know, um, encourage your student to use that as a way to keep the I-20 or the DS 2019 uh, in, in place. Yes, in the back. Good question. The, the question is, is this the same for Canadians? And the answer is uh, yes, with exception of the actual visa sticker in the passport. That is the only component that, it, that does not apply to Canadian citizens. But otherwise, as a Canadian citizen, you would need the valid passport and the I-20 or DS-2019 with the travel signature. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Any, any other questions about travel? Yeah. That's a great question. The question is, uh, for students who are transferring from uh, another school in the United States, boarding school, preparatory school in the United States, they've transferred their immigration record to the University of Chicago. Does the travel signature um, correspond to their prior school? And the answer is no. We would have issued to them an updated I-20 and provided a travel signature um, as part of that transfer process. Yeah. So now moving forward, although the student's you know, immigration number won't have changed, uh, the institution reflected on the document will have. And then Sarah or anyone in the Office of International Affairs can provide that signature moving forward. Yeah, good. Any other questions about travel? Yes. So the question is, uh, if they need to renew their passport, if their passport is expired, or it's lost, um, you know, or stolen for whatever reason, uh, we would encourage that a student visit visit us. You know, first and foremost, um, we'll work with them to uh, file a, a police report for a lost government ID, um, and then you know refer them to the actual consulate if there is a, a consulate from of, of their country of citizenship here in Chicago. They can work with the consulate to actually apply for the renewed visa, or excuse me, passport, or with the embassy in Washington, D.C. for the renewal. What that does mean, however, is if your student loses the passport, it's like, you know, I mean, the, the visa sticker itself is, is in now the lost passport, and it means the next time they're at home, they would need to actually apply for the, the updated or new visa stamp to correspond so that that new visa sticker is placed in the new in the new passport. Good question. Does that. <clears throat> so in short, you know, they'll be working with the, the consular embassy of their home country here in the US to renew uh, and then we can help them, <clears throat> excuse me, work through the process of getting the updated visa stamp, which can only unfortunately happen at a US consular embassy abroad typically in their home country. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the one clarification uh, about the visa sticker is that, you know, it is required only at the time of entry. Um, the visa stamps themselves, you know, are issued with validity dates that correspond to reciprocity 
you know, between the United States and, and whatever country. Um, and that sometimes means that a student's visa sticker may expire, you know, uh, within the four-year period of their study here at the University of Chicago. Uh, and so all that means, really, is that if their visa sticker does expire and they're here in the United States, there's no problem uh, in that period. It just means the next time they do travel abroad, if the visa sticker itself has expired, they'll have to go through the, the renewal process with the US consular embassy. Yeah. Good. Any other questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, would they need a new I-20 or DS-2019 um, to obtain a new visa stamp? And they could get that before they left here, so we could provide them with an updated I-20 if they needed, uh, or they could use the I-20 in their possession. What, what that means is that the passport number itself does not actually appear on the I-20 or DS-2019. So no information has to be changed if the passport itself is, is updated or a new passport is issued. So you won't need an updated I-20 because the passport number itself doesn't appear on it, right? Um, but if they get a new passport, we can provide them with an updated copy if they need of their I-20 or DS-2019. Um, but it does mean that they may actually have to then get a new visa sticker or travel with both the valid and the expired passport, right? So if the valid passport um, you know, doesn't have the valid visa stamp in it, and they still have the expired passport with the valid visa stamp, they can travel with both passports and their I-20. Keeping old I-20s is going to be valuable down the road as they're considering you know, other options post-graduation as they look at H-1Bs. Uh, or green cards, that kind of thing. It's, it is not uncommon anymore for students to you know, provide copies of their I-20s or DS-2019s as part of those petitions. So we will tell them that. Um, again, it's, it's just more benefit to scanning you know, or having electronic copies of those documents that can easily be pulled up and provided. Yep. Good. Any other travel-related questions? Yes. So if your students are traveling in the United States, um, you know, of, of course they can use their passport uh, to, to board an airplane. It won't be uncommon for your students uh, over the course of the next four years to obtain a social security number and then potentially get a temporary state ID in the state of Illinois. Uh, or they may have a government ID you know, from home um, that they may prefer to use, you know, when, you know, getting on a plane or once they are 21 or even before they're 21 in order to get into a bar or something like that, they might prefer to use, you know, a government ID card rather than carrying their passport. Um, so really, uh, traveling in the U.S., you know, we, we recommend that they simply just carry uh, government-issued identification, whether that's home government or in this case, you know, U.S. government-issued ID. Right. The, the University of Chicago ID card is not considered government issued ID. Um, so it, it does not uh, it does not make a student you know, eligible to board an airplane either domestically or internationally, you know, with just the, the UC ID. Um, so that's one thing. It, it comes up quite a bit with with students because, you know, uh, in the US, the drinking culture, you know, is such that in order to get into even some restaurants here, you know, you have to show ID, um, so they know whether you're 21 and older or or not, you know. And if you're not, then they might give you a wristband of some kind or something. Um, but that is when it comes up typically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the question is: Is the driver's license sufficient ID? And if they have a U.S. Uh, issued driver's license, that is uh, valid for for boarding an airplane. Yeah. An international driver's license, you know, could potentially also work. Yeah, I think it just depends on, you know, for what purpose. You know, again, if you're trying to enter a restaurant or a bar with a driver's license, an international driver's license, it's it's probably highly likely the person reviewing that document will have no idea, but it will look official enough that they'll they'll just let them in. So, yeah, <clears throat> we try to catch students within nine months. Uh, actually, you know, we tell them they're valid for 12 months, but each academic year that they're here, we're reaching out and saying, you know, you need to come and get a signature. You need to bring your document to this location, whether it's, you know, at our office or at their residence halls, you know, again, the library, uh, some of the major kind of intersections where students are. Uh, and we try to bribe them with, you know, 
granola bars and apples. We should use candy, actually. Pardon? People are traveling home, make sure they got... Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, the main point simply being, you know, before they, they leave, you know, we remind them and we ask you to remind them, don't forget your passport and don't forget your I-20 or your DS-2019, you know. Just make sure you have all of your documentation with you. If your student forgets, uh, you know, or for whatever reason, you know, in transit or once they're home, you know, the document is either destroyed. I mean, we've, we've heard it all from, you know, my, my I-20 fell in the fireplace to, you know, uh, it got washed in the, the laundry. Um, if that is the case, we can, you know, send an updated fresh copy to them abroad. Yeah, to facilitate the entry. Yeah. So the, the question being, if you have a, if you have a picture of it, um, is that helpful? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, and this comes up, you know, when, you know, scenarios are such that there's not sufficient time to send, you know, a fresh copy. In, you know, so, so if a student writes to us and says, you know, I'm in, you know, Beijing and I'm getting on an airplane, you know, tomorrow morning for Chicago, we know there's no way for us to, to ship a, an original document to them. The student can use the, the electronic copy from their phone or from their email, or we will scan and send them a copy, right? The other note that I'll just make here is that as, a, as an institution, we are uh, very close with, as close as potentially we can be, uh, with Customs and Border Protection here at Chicago. Um, so as students are arriving in the US, if their port of entry is O'Hare International Airport, and there is some question about one of our students, Customs and Border Protection will reach out to our office and say, you know, can you confirm the student is enrolled or you know, is in fact who they say they are with the ID that they have on their phone, something like that. And then we can work to kind of, you know, take care of that. Um, so not, not to plug O'Hare because, you know, not all flights are, are easily, you know, um, sorted through O'Hare, but uh, that is one benefit of, of being in Chicago. <laughs> yes, so the, the question is, if you're international, can you get government issued ID? Uh, and once a student uh, is eligible in the state of Illinois for a social security number, they can apply for a driver's license um, or a temporary state ID and use that for government issued ID. Yeah, yep. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a moment. Any, any other travel related questions? The, the last thing I will say, and, and some of you may already know this, uh, but your students can have you know, multiple valid US visas in their passport at any one time. So they may have a B1, B2 visa, or they might actually have ESTA clearance, um, as well as either an F1 or J1 student visa. Uh, and that's okay. One of the, um, you know, one of the things that we do uh, is encourage students, you know, after their arrival uh, to check their I-94 or their arrival record in the United States, and we have a link to that for them. Um, but that just makes, sh it, it, it's their verification that Customs and Border Protection, you know, in fact, did, you know, process their entry correctly on the right date in the right status, right? Any questions? All right, I'm going to talk quickly about some work authorization pieces and, and Social Security will become a part of this. Um, students in F1 or J1 uh, student visa status are eligible to work on campus uh, here at the University of Chicago. No prior authorization or permission is required. Uh, this is an automatic benefit of their visa status and, and they can work only part-time. Um, so during academic periods, students are restricted from an institutional perspective, but also per the, the federal regulation from working any more than 20 hours in a given week. Um, but we do hear from students who you know, find research opportunities um, as research assistants, or maybe they, you know, want to work in the library, you know, for a period. Uh, all of those things are um, completely allowable per, you know, the, the visa uh, regulations, uh, but also from an institutional standpoint. Uh, and, and, you know, if they do get a job on campus, um, then they are then eligible to apply for a social security number, right? So in order to to be eligible for a social security number, uh, you have to have been offered employment, whether that's on campus or in an internship 
capacity, let's just say, during their first or second summer. Right? So on-campus employment is permitted. No prior authorization is required. The employment authorization benefits, or the employment benefits tied to either the F1 or J1 student visa, are listed here. Uh, most, most of our students in F1 status will take advantage of curricular practical training, or CPT. Uh, this is pre-graduation authorization uh, that typically corresponds to an internship or an off-campus job in some capacity. The requirement here being that whatever they are doing off-campus uh, is directly related to their program of study. All of your students will have the opportunity to explore an internship option while they're here at the University of Chicago. You will likely hear, if you haven't already, of the Metcalf program. Uh, actually, in this building, directly down the, the hall that way uh, is career advancement, um, who work tirelessly uh, with, with, with all students in the college uh, for the purpose of not only getting them you know, access to internships that they're interested in, but soft programming around you know, looking for jobs, interviewing, writing a resume, um, you know, how to, I, they, they do things even like handshake you know, in, in the US context, you know, or um, don't chew gum if you show up at your, you know, your interview, that kind of thing. Uh, so CPT is the corresponding permission or authorization for international students on F-1 visas. The related post-graduation uh, employment benefit for students on F-1 visas is called optional practical training, or OPT. Um, so you'll likely be hearing these words, and we uh, at the Office of International Affairs host uh, workshops throughout the year, um, you know, every quarter, typically two or three times per quarter, uh, on, on these types of employment benefits for both F and J, um, J1 visa holders. For J1 uh, student visas, academic training is the corresponding employment authorization that a student would actually use to, to take an internship. Any, any questions about the employment benefits? Yes. So the, the Office of Career Advancement, um, in this building actually, directly across the hall, uh, that this is their location. Uh, they uh, have a, a, an incredible, incredible staff you know, uh, who are um, industry specific. You know? So if you have a student who's interested in investment banking or just may want to explore an internship opportunity in investment banking, they're going to be able to you know, work with that student um, to find opportunities you know, for internships, but also just give some context around what an internship in investment banking is going to look like. Um, they bring employers to campus for, um, for recruiting events. You know, uh, again, not, not only just large recruitment you know, fairs, but also industry-specific you know, recruiting events over the course of, of every academic year. Uh, and, and internships you know, are supported both, of course, in the United States, but internships abroad. Uh, this past summer, we had, we had a large number of students, undergraduate students in general, uh, interning around the world. Um, and and you know, I think that um, is, is testament you know, to the work that Career Advancement does. Uh, and they work very closely with alumni of the university you know, to find those types of opportunities. Um, but it is important that students who are on student visas in the U.S., if they do take an internship in the U.S., that they have the corresponding authorization, right? But if they're going to be doing an internship, I don't know, in Hong Kong, for example, uh, then career advancement you know, will work with the student to determine what is required for you know, local immigration, right? So if you are a UK, well, maybe not UK. Um, if you're a French citizen and you're actually going to intern in Hong Kong, there may be some internship-related uh, visa that's required in order to actually do something like that. And they will be supporting that process you know, with your students along the way. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, good question. The, the, the question being, uh, from the time of offer um, to application for a social security number, how long until you get the number? Uh, it, it does vary. We're, we're seeing right around two weeks right now. Um, but I will also say that the Social Security number itself is not required to begin working. Simply applying in advance of starting is sufficient, you know, and then the number will come 
Uh, the other thing I'll say about social security numbers is that they are issued for life. Um, you know, so if your student uh, has a social security number based on you know, previous experience um, in the US, then you know, that is the number that they would be using uh, you know, throughout you know, their, their time here. There are a few other questions, yeah. The, the, the question, is it difficult for F1 students to get an internship? Um, you know, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna name drop here, but I think, you know, maybe, you know, I, I think the University of Chicago has a reputation, um, you know, for students to uh, navigate, you know, the recruitment process for internships, um, you know, and, and more to the point, find the best fit, right? Uh, the Office of Career, you know, Advancement you know, is, is completely dedicated to that, you know, to that process. Uh, and we work very closely with them to ensure that as the student moves through, you know, even just the interview process for an internship, uh, that we're ready, you know, when they're ready to accept an offer to, you know, get the CPT authorization that they need. Good, good question. Is time spent on CPT deducted from the 12 months you have eligible for po post-completion OPT? And the answer is, it is not actually deducted. Uh, it is not deducted. Um, so regardless, your student will have that standard period of 12 months of OPT. Um, and again, this is based on current immigration regulation in this country. And as you all know, that seems to be, that seems to vary widely depending on Twitter, you know, at the, the, depending on the day. So um, at least for now, well, and, and I will say, you know, that, part of the regulation is, you know, it has been congressionally authorized. So, you know, changes to it would require a very substantial uh, movement on the part of the U.S. Congress, which is, is not really doing much at the moment anyway. But um, it, it, there may be, you know, impacts, you know, uh, or changes, for example, to the 24-month STEM extension that many of you may have heard about. Um, you know, that's been kind of a constant grumble uh, you know, from the current administration from the get-go, um, but you know, to date, nothing really has changed. Uh, we do. Uh, this brings up a good uh, a good moment to to plug a uh, a newsletter that we send to students, and we're happy to subscribe parents. Um, we send a biweekly uh, electronic newsletter uh, that is specifically for international students here at the university, uh, and we we highlight changes like this. You know, so if something does change, you know, that's how we're going to communicate it and then hold workshops, you know, and, and classes around it, you know, afterwards. But if you would like to, you know, be on that list, you know, you know, feel free to go to the, the website and that information will come up in just a moment as well. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, over here. Question is, you know, can you use CPT outside of summer quarter, for example? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. However, um, you know, you cannot work more than 20 hours a week during the academic quarter. So it could be a part-time internship um, that they're, you know, exploring, and, and that, you know, is reasonable. Yes. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Yeah, good question. Uh, with the Social Security number, is there any implication um, for, uh, for tax, taxes? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, the Office of International Affairs does support international students through the U.S. taxation process, um, so every typically right right around you know the end of February, we're going to start communicating with your students to say, uh, you know, soon we will be providing you access to online um, tax filing support that is free to you to use. We host uh, both online workshops, but also in-person workshops for students to uh, learn about it. It's it's an incredibly you know ridiculously complicated, you know, um, process. But for most of your students, you know, while they're not interning, maybe uh, even if they're working on campus, uh, the, the process can be very simple, you know, using the software that we're providing to them. Uh, and if they attend the, the workshops, then they can ask questions and, and just go through that process. What, what I will say is that even if you didn't have, you know, any earned income in the United States, so in the past calendar year, if your student didn't have any income, didn't take an on-campus job or an internship that would otherwise result in, they still should be filing, uh, you know, something with the Internal Revenue Service, the, the taxation branch of the U.S. government. And we, again, make that cl clear to them. Um, but it is important for them just to, to take note of that and ensure that they're getting to it every year.
Yeah, true. So the question is, you know, if, if my student, you know, wants to apply for a driver's license in the state of Illinois, one thing to keep in mind if you've had, you know, if you have other students who have been at other schools outside of the state of Illinois is that driver's license laws, you know, and driving laws specific are state specific. So it may not be the case that what, what applies in California, for example, applies in Illinois. But in the state of Illinois, to be eligible for a driver's license, you first have to be eligible and obtain a social security number. So that is kind of the first step. And it does mean um, that, you know, students could, you know, apply for a social security number after they get an on-campus job and then move through the driver's license, you know, process. Um, or if they have a, a, a social security number, you know, issued previously, uh, then they can use that to apply for the driver's license. I, you know, the, the, the great part, and, and we'll get into this, you know, now, uh, the great part about being in a city like Chicago is that there are so many transportation options, not just publicly available, but also available through the university. Um, you know, so, and, and parking, you know, gets super complicated, you know, in the, the city of Chicago and can get very expensive. Um, so I, I don't know that that, you know, warrants not applying for a driver's license, but, you know, I'm just throwing it out there, so. <laughs> it's, it's true. You, you have to have an offer of employment to get a social security number. Yeah. And most, most undergraduates, uh, again, won't go, you know, won't try for the social security number until after their first, you know, academic year here. Um, you know, I think one of the, one of the, um, the most common, you know, uh, I don't know that it's a complaint, but maybe just adjustments, you know, that we hear from, from not just undergraduates, but from graduates, you know, and not just international, I mean, all students coming to the University of Chicago is just that the pace of the academic quarter is such uh, that it goes so quickly in 10 weeks and is so rigorous, you know, that outside of, you know, uh, maintaining, you know, their studies and, you know, getting involved and figuring out that balance between my involvement, you know, as a student and, you know, adhering to my academic responsibilities is, is such that they don't often have time to really uh, take a job in the first year. Yeah. Over here, yes. Yeah, so the question is, if, I, if, if my student has a, an international driver's license, can they drive in Chicago? If you have, if you have a driver's license from home, um, you know, the, the val validity of that in the state of Illinois uh, again, depends on the country issuing the actual driver's license. No one of those driver's licenses is valid uh, for more than six months from the initial entry into the U.S. So in this case, if, if, you're, if your student you know, is, is just getting here, you know, the, the driver's license itself will be valid. You know, typically, for, for most European Union countries, it's going to be six months. Yep. Yeah, there was another question up here. Yeah, yeah. So the, the question is, can the students apply for the social security number themselves? Uh, and the answer is yes. We can help them with that process. We have information on our website about, you know, what documents need to be prepared. Uh, we write them a letter supporting the social security application, and then uh, we can tell them to which of the social security administration offices, you know, to go to. Uh, thankfully, there is a very uh, nearby social security office uh, here in Hyde Park. Uh, just just a few blocks south of the Midway, the big the gr big green park over here. Yeah, yep, right. So the the question about uh, tax filing: if the student uh, if your student has earned income outside of the United States, is that actually reflected? And the answer is no. No, it it will fully or ultimately depend then on the student's taxation status in the U.S. Um, but initially, at least for the first five years in the U.S. Uh, you're not to be considered a, uh, a resident for tax purposes in the U.S. Yeah, good question. Yeah, right. So the, the question about the international driver's license, if they renew it every time they are home, the answer is, is no. Eventually, it, it, the, the, the state of Illinois is not considering um, you know, the validity of the, the home driver's license, whether it's home country or international. Uh, they're basing this off of, you know, the initial entry into the United States in, in the visa status, yeah. And then the maximum duration or validity period is typically no more than six months. Yeah. Yes. No, just to, yeah, good, good point. Just to clarify, to be eligible to even apply for a Social Security number, you have to have a job offer. Yeah. Yep. 
and then and then the student can work with us to prepare the you know to prepare the the correct materials in order to go to apply for the social security number but the job offer is required it's a it's a great question the question being if my student uh, gets an internship outside of the United States uh, and earns income for that, is that, does that become part of the US tax filing? And the answer is no. So we're talking solely about US-based earned income when, when talking about tax, tax returns. So the, the, the second part to that question, if I'm wiring money, um, you know, especially for tuition, you know, et cetera, um, is that taxable? And the answer is no. So the, the question, uh, do undergraduate international students have to file tax returns every year? The answer is yes. There is, a, there is some filing required of all students on student visas in the US, regardless of whether they had earned income in the prior year. So typically, what that looks like, if you're an international student who did not have an internship that paid you, did not have an on-campus job, you're filing uh, a form that simply is just saying, you know, I was here and earned no income uh, and here in an F1 or J1 student visa status. And that does not require a social security number. That does not require a social security number. That, that part of the taxation per process. Students who have scholarships, uh, you know, whether that's from the university or outside entities, um, you know, uh, could you know, also report those things if they're again U.S.-based uh, as part of their um, as part of their tax returns. In most cases, you know, if a student is receiving a scholarship from the university or again from a U.S.-based entity, uh, that that benefit is going to be taxed. And in most circumstances, for whatever reason, uh, taxed over you know. Uh, the amount that is necessary. So the, the filing itself is really applying for a refund of the overtaxation from the U.S. government. So that means that the student would theoretically get some money in return. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, where else do you see Social Security numbers, you know, pop up? Uh, and the answer is, um, you know, I mean, it, it becomes, it becomes, uh, you know, not even necessary or required, but if your student moves off campus, for example, and needs to uh, initiate electricity or internet, you know, to their uh, to their new apartment or to get a phone plan, in some in some instances, it can make that process easier. It's not required, um, but really, you know, the the one thing about the social security number, I, you know, I think it was used for so much more, and often we get the question from students: if I have a social security number, it means I can work in the United States. Uh, the Social Security number itself isn't tied to any sort of, you know, benefit like that. Um, it does not mean that you can work in the United States with a Social Security number only. Uh, it's not government-issued identification even, you know, so there's no photo on it, you know. It literally is uh, an eight-digit number, you know, that's typically used for identification. Yes, back there, and then we'll move over. So, so, so the, the question is, if the internship is more than 20 hours, um, <laughs> is another visa required? The, the answer to this is that during the academic quarter, you know, autumn, winter, and spring, students are not permitted to work more than 20 hours. So it wouldn't even be possible uh, to intern or work more than 20 hours you know, in that capacity, um, at least at an internship here at the university. If a student during the summer quarter has a 25 hour per week internship as a research assistant here at the university, and then takes an off-campus internship for 20 hours, that is permitted. During the summer quarter, the annual vacation quarter, students can work as much as they would like. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so the, the tax filing actually happens uh, online, and then you know, students actually just mail it in. And again, we help them through that process every, every year, every February, March, you know, they're gonna start receiving information about that process. Yes, here. So any, any employment, freelance, I mean, it's not uncommon for our students to do this type of thing where, uh, where their employer-employee relationship resides outside of the United States, where remuneration or payment actually resides outside of the United States. Uh, no prior permission or authorization from an immigration standpoint in the US is required. So those things are permitted so long as they remain outside. Yeah, so the question is, is a social security number needed to actually see a doctor? And the answer is no.
And, and I'll talk briefly about that in just a moment. One more in the back. No. So if you opt to take classes over summer, if your student opts to take classes over summer, uh, that is permitted. Um, but you, you, again, are not restricted to that 20 hours per week because it's not a typical academic uh, it's not a typical academic quarter for undergraduate students. I want to I want to touch briefly on a few other things that you know that we uh, really try over the course at least of this first quarter and the first academic year here uh, that we try to bring up with with students, you know, all students, undergraduate students um, as well as graduate students, uh, and that is um, their their safety and security. I want to mention uh, specifically. The University of Chicago Police Force, um, if you didn't know this, is the largest private police force uh, in the country. I don't know that that is necessarily you know, something to brag about, but it is, in fact, the case. Um, they are ever present on this campus uh, and you know, can be reached. Uh, you likely have seen these, these uh, towers that say emergency that have a blue light on the top. If a student is you know, walking at any point, uh, feels unsafe or maybe needs emergency medical assistance, uh, they can of course use their phone or they can hit the red button on that tower uh, and that will notify police you know, to come to them immediately. Uh, they, they brag, the University of Chicago Police, uh, they, they do claim to be able to reach any part of campus uh, within 30 seconds you know, of being called. So again, it, you know, I, I don't know if that's a, a good or a bad thing, but it is in fact the case. So. The, uh, the other thing I'll mention, uh, University of Chicago Safety and Security, um, as part of the University of Chicago app, uh, has a lot of really good information on it, not just for students, but also for uh, parents. If you want to uh, stay aware of what's happening on campus, you know, if there are emergency alerts, you know, anything related to class closures or weather, um, any of those types of things, uh, those alerts are actually going to be sent out through the app. So if you haven't already, um, you know, I would encourage you to actually download uh, the University of Chicago app. Uh, safety escorts, as well as um, night, night, night ride shuttles, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, night ride shuttles. They, they are available to students um, you know, if they, again, are walking from you know, one end of campus to the other, maybe after studying late you know, at the library on the north side, but they're living you know, in south campus, they can actually request a safety escort or use a night ride shuttle to actually get home. And that's something um, that is free to them to use. Uh, it is part of you know, their, their time here. Any questions? So the question is, if you dial 911 on campus, will it go to the University of, or will it go to Chicago Police or to University of Chicago? And it will go to both, typically. Uh, but University of Chicago Police are, you know, are police. So anytime anything is happening, you know, on campus um, or even, you know, around campus, they're going to be aware and involved. So if you're dialing 911 on campus, you know, it's going to the University of Chicago Police. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I will just mention, you know, students over the course of their time here will have bikes or laptops. Uh, University of Chicago um, police will, uh, uh, will register bicycles for students, you know, if, if they would like. That makes it easier if, for whatever reason, the bike is, re is misplaced or stolen. It can be returned to the rightful owner if it's found. Uh, I mentioned night ride shuttles um, throughout campus and Hyde Park as well. Uh, and the other thing I, I will just say about safety and security, some of the things that we tell students, you know, uh, be aware of your surroundings. And in order to be aware of your surroundings, having headphones on or both of them in um, is not going to, you know, be conducive to that, uh, to that statement. So hearing, you know, they're going to hear it from us. We know that they're likely going to hear it from you. Um, and we try to ensure that, uh, that they're aware of, you know, some of the, the tips um, you know, that, that can be, you know, helpful to them while they're here. There was a question up here. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, you know, outside of Hyde Park and the university campus, um, are, there, are there neighborhoods, you know, uh, to maybe avoid? And I don't think that, you know, as a, a Chicago resident for the past 15 years, um, you know, the, the and I, I don't live here, I live, I live on the north side of the city, um, I don't think that 
you know, I don't think that there are specific neighborhoods to avoid. Uh, I think it's a matter of understanding, you know, where you are, uh, where you're going. We often tell students to ensure that, you know, before you leave, if you're going someplace you've never been, you know, make sure that you've mapped out the route, you know, that you know kind of where, uh, where it is that you're going and how you're going to get there, whether that's public transportation, Uber or Lyft, you know, et cetera. If something feels uncomfortable, um, you know, leave immediately. Uh, of course, but is is there a specific neighborhood um, to avoid, uh, you know, violence in this city is notorious. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are aware of that. Uh, it does, you know, concentrate in locations um, further, even further south and further to the west of here. Um, students, for the, the most part, may have no, you know, no reason to, to go to those places. We know and, and you know, again, Safety and security is conveying this information to them, but also their their peers, uh, you know, are are telling them, you know, where to where to go, where not to go, you know. Um, really, it, it boils down to you know common sense. Many of your students are coming from major urban areas, you know, similar to Chicago, um, and if they're not, then they're adapting, you know, to being in an urban environment. And Chicago is just that. So being aware. Of your surroundings and and attempting to you know be smart about you know um, about you know your your kind of existence right you know so so not wandering around at two o'clock in the morning by yourself you know is, is going to be going to be helpful yeah the schedule uh, it's actually available on on the uh, the University of Chicago app they run continuously. Yeah, and there are a number of other there are a number of other transportation routes, bus routes, you know, that run on campus and within Hyde Park, um, you know, at different times of the day. So, some will run, you know, many many shuttles, you know, at once in the morning during rush hour, you know, and then kind of cut back throughout the day and then get heavy again, you know, in the in the late afternoon or evening. Um, but but these these also go very late into the night, um, you know, so. Bus routes, uh, night ride shuttles, you know, and others will go, you know, well past midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning, depending on the, the route. Yeah, the, uh, the University of Chicago, the safety and security website uh, has, has those statistics um, that they are absolutely, you know, able to access and review. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yes, so the, the question is, you know, if my, if my student requires emergency care and does not have University of Chicago health insurance, do they need a social security number to obtain care? And the answer is no. In a medical emergency, should, again, dial 911, you know, or go to the hospital. I mean, the nice thing uh, is the university has a hospital. Um, students, even, even on insurance that is not the University of Chicago insurance, uh, should first go, if it's not an emergency, should first go to student health services. Uh, that always should be their first stop. Um, because those are, you know, our medical providers, there are nurses, there is a pharmacy, you know, in the actual student health center um, that, uh, you know, is, is robust and they, you know, they are here, um, you know, throughout the week. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, is the University of Chicago Health Insurance fully comprehensive? You know, I, the answer is yes. Um, you know, there. There's no waiting period um, for pre-existing, you know, conditions or anything, you know, along those lines. There is on um, the Student Health Services website uh, a checklist of comparable coverage, and I think what you'll find is that what's available through the university is actually, you know, kind of the highest that you know that you potentially uh, can get. Um, you know, augmenting that with, you know, with other plans, I, I think would just be a, a personal preference, but, you know, for the, the purpose of their time here, it's, it's going to be very comprehensive. And not just for basic care, you know, I, I don't feel well, you know, so I'm going to go to the student health center and see it, you know, see a doctor and they're going to prescribe me, you know, some medication for a, a cold. Um, but if they need to go see a specialist, for example, you know, all of those things are going to be part of that coverage. Uh, and again, the students should actually begin with student health ser services, you know. So if they want a referral, even if they know to whom they'd like to, to see, 
you know, going first to student health services and getting the referral to the outside specialist is going to be the, the natural progression there. Right, that's, a, that's another great question. Are they covered in the US and abroad? And the, the answer to that is they are also covered abroad. Yeah. I mean, we, we realize that, you know, for some of you, um, you know, you will also have health insurance on them while they're at home as well. But if they need it, you know, then it is in fact there. I want to just draw your attention. Oh, yeah. So if over the course of the four years your students decide to study abroad, you know, whether that's in Paris or one of the other centers or elsewhere, um, not only will they have the University of Chicago health insurance or, you know, their comparable coverage if it's not that, um, but the study abroad office will actually guide them through uh, adding some additional coverage, you know, specific to traveling. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, you know, does uh, student health services cover things like, you know, like dental, um, uh, you know, physical therapy, you know, or counseling, you know, and psychological services? Um, the, the dental insurance is an additional plan, um, but it is available. Uh, I, I often hear from international students that dental care and dental health insurance outside of this country is often better than, you know, what, what they might find here. But if they need some emergency, you know, service, then they can, they can find that through, through health services or by adding the dental plan. Um, the physical therapy and the counseling and psychological services, that is also part of student health services. Um, so student health and counseling uh, will be opening a new center, uh, a massive you know, a renovation here on 59th Street, um, uh, directly you know, due west of us uh, here in, you know, over the course really of the next year. Um, and those things are covered. You know, and not only are they covered, but they're encouraged. And uh, the, the Health and Counseling Center has um, a variety of workshops you know, for students, especially as they're adapting to you know, life on their own. Um, so if, if you notice that your student is talking about having trouble sleeping, you know, they have a sleep lab. If they, you know, uh, now that they have access to you know, these, you know, these dining you know, facilities you know, as part of their residence halls, you know, maybe they're, they're unsure uh, you know, even just about their diet or they want to speak to someone about, you know, about that. That is part of it as well. But they do other things like coping, you know, workshops, you know, if, if you know, your student is feeling stressed, you know, or procrastination, uh, you know, you know uh, series, um, study skills, you know, and, and really kind of the approach is, you know, your, your, your mental, your physical health are going to, you know, are, are major players, you know, in your academic well-being, you know, as well. So I want to, um, we, we, we try to you know, ensure that parents um, hear this as well. And we hear from students, and this is a pervasive issue in this country at the moment, just given the current administration's kind of uh, lack of protections. But there are increasing numbers of uh, telephone scams you know, affecting really everyone. Um, but we do hear from students often. They'll call us and say, you know, I just got a phone call from someone who said, that you know they know my parents, or they you know that I'm in violation of my home you know uh, immigration regulation, or I'm in violation of my visa status in this country, and you know they're demanding that I pay fines or fees. Um, we tell them, and and we're telling you, in, in to ensure that we're all kind of giving the same message, the U.S. government will never call uh, will never call you. Um, so if someone is calling and telling you that they are a representative of the government um, and demanding money, uh, please tell your students you know, to hang up immediately uh, in those instances. I, I even myself get these phone calls where people say that my social security number is in violation and that there's a warrant out for my arrest. And these are just all scams. Um, unfortunately, at least once a year, a student you know, uh, falls into you know, this really terrible psychological you know, trap of being on the phone with someone who then extorts money in the form of Apple gift cards or other types of gift cards you know, where they're scratching and taking pictures and sending these things to, to the person on the other end of the phone. So if you hear from your students that, you know, that they're you know, getting these types of calls, uh, we, we, we ask them to contact us you know, if they are hearing from someone, you know, if you hear about it, you know, please just reassure them that that, that is, in fact, not something that ever is going to be uh, the case, that is not a real, a real call. 
I want to just address something that occasionally comes up with this group, uh, and that is if any of you have students who, for this first year or the first year and, and however long, uh, will be under the age of 18, uh, you as a parent should be um, filing a waiver with US Health Services, or not US Health Services, Campus Health Services. So the Student Health Center um, cannot treat an underage minor under the age of 18 unless they have uh, your written consent as a parent or legal guardian, right? So if any of you have a student for you know at least the first year or first couple of quarters uh, who will in fact be under the age of 18, um, then you'll want to actually visit this link uh, and download the waiver or the, the authorization release form. Uh, you can sign it and submit it to health services either while you're here or even um, even from abroad, just to ensure that your student uh, can be treated when they, when they, if they need to be. Yes. So if, if your student is over the age of 18, uh, then they have to give you authorization to be informed. <laughs> it's true. HIPAA is uh, HIPAA is, is an acronym for um, for a policy, a regulatory policy uh, providing privacy to to anyone's health health information, uh, in effect. And that's why if your child is over the age of 18. They would have to give you, give authorization or permission to the the health provider to give any of their information to anyone, whether it's a parent or even another doctor, a specialist, or something like that. Yeah. So there is. Um, I I know that they're updating their system, um, but there is uh, there's going to be yeah a, an online portal, a student portal in effect, you know, for students to use if they want to schedule an appointment. Uh, or if they're they're communicating with a nurse or a doctor, they're doing so via the portal, um, billing all of that information. If you you know if they're having tests done, then the the lab results you know typically would be reflected there. Immunization records you know now moving forward will be you know recorded in the the portal there as well. Yeah, good question. So. That is kind of it. If there are any other questions, I know that I'm, uh, I don't know what time it is, but we're probably over. So any other questions? Well, thank you again. Have a wonderful day today. Uh, I hear that it's going to rain this afternoon, so make sure that you have an umbrella. Uh, but enjoy your time here at the University of Chicago. Please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have follow-up questions. Again, this this. Uh, session was recorded and you'll have access to it uh, after the fact. But otherwise, welcome to the University of Chicago family and have a great rest of the, of the day. Thank you.